Let us prepare our hearts for the word of the Lord. Let us pray. We pray you, O almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, to preserve the works of your mercy, that your church being spread through the whole world may continue with unchanging faith in the confession of your name. Amen. Boy, what a nice day outside. The weather lately has been great here in New England. We have a short period of getting things done, and you know, a lot of times we see this good weather, and we want to skip church and you know, go do, go do these things that we need to do. In fact, this morning I was thinking about the chores I have to do. I have to, I've got stuff to do around the yard. This morning I was thinking about painting the back deck because it's so sunny. Um, I have a ton of other work to do. I've got a boat that needs maintenance. I know there are people that would prefer to go fish. Do you wish you were fishing right now? Wrong answer. <laughs> you probably want to go fishing too, don't you? It's such a perfect day today. Wouldn't it be easy to skip church today? After all, our priest is on vacation. We got just a deacon's mass, right? Let's see, what kind of excuses can we come up with to not be here? Well, after reading today's gospel, all of those excuses that were brewing in my head suddenly went away. They instantly evaporated like water sprinkled on a hot pan. I think I may have even heard some sizzling or something. I don't know. What, day, what does today's gospel lesson suggest to us? One of the intriguing beliefs that are found in the many religions of man is that at death, we pass from one life to another. We, tr we transmigrate. I suppose the origin of this is man's instinct that human life does not end with death, but that in his inner self, he believes that he lives on in another state. He might ask, how can a lifetime of struggle, paying mortgages, love, and emotions simply go poof and evaporate into nothingness? How can that happen? Perhaps the difficulty in imagining life beyond this world has prompted the image in certain religions of man passing at death to another form of life in this world, from a person to a tree, for example. This transmigration of one life to another in this world has also involved certain doctrines of what is called karma. We've all heard of that, right? Karma. Karma, a doctrine in which the force generated by a person's actions in life determines his or her destiny. Perhaps the origin of this notion is man's instinct in reality arising from his conscience that a judgment on his life will come, and that judgment will have consequences in his life in the hereafter. Such instincts can mutate into images that are far from what has been divinely revealed to us. God has revealed that life is a precious one-off gift, and everything depends on how it is lived. Each person has but one shot, and not as the doctrine of transmigration and karma would have it, several. The truth is this, there is only one life for each of us, and whether he or she likes it, there will be an examination, a judgment at the end, which will carry enormous consequences for the individual. You know, I've known lots of highly educated people in academia and in industry, many of whom reject the notion of an existing God. I've read of philosophers of world standing who in cavalier fashion dismiss religion and even objective morality. They appear unaware of the enormity of the stakes that are involved, of how it would be, to say the least, safer for them to live, live as if God never existed, as if no judgment followed death. After all, don't those that do live as if God doesn't exist appear happier in their life doing what they want? doing things whenever they want, all without a lick of self-consciousness? 
And if there is the prospect of another life on this earth, doesn't that give them a chance for a do-over? You know, hedonistic now, contrite faithfulness later? Can people really be happy without God? You know, it's a tough, touchy subject. You know, you hear a lot about abortion here in the last few days, haven't you? And it doesn't really matter where you fall on that subject. But I've known, I've had a lot of people come to me that have had abortions, and there's one thing that they always sort of all say. And it's not the usual thing that you normally hear about on the arguments for, for or against. They feel a great emptiness in their lives. Something, nobody told them in all these planning programs and all this, you know, things that they talk about, uh, about abortion, again, on both sides, that you can have a great emptiness in your life afterwards. You can't get rid of it. It's a regret. It's there forever. It's in your life. These are what people are telling me. I'm not making this up. This is what I've heard. It's, it's painful for them. Imagine living in that situation without God. That's going pretty deep, isn't it? Without, without godly value in their moral compass, can they ever be happy? What is the measurement for happiness? What scale do we use? How do you have a sense for accomplishment without God? Granted that following this life, there is the judgment of God. Every day counts. For we cannot know when this life will end. It could happen five minutes from now, a second from now, 10 years from now. We don't know. What counts every day is our response to the call of the will of God as manifested in what appears to be our duty as Christians. Is that hard to understand? Does everybody get that? Speaking as such, this means taking our stand with Christ, the living Jesus who is God incarnate. It means accepting his invitation and calls as they come to us day to day. What is the danger here? The danger is that we will find excuses to avoid doing what we don't want to do, which is our duty. It is this pattern of finding excuses and secretly justifying to ourselves the avoidance of our duty as it was described in our gospel lesson today. And people can convince themselves of anything. You know, once you start finding excuses not to do something, or maybe do something that you shouldn't be doing, you get good at it. There's a pattern develops. You get so good at it that you're fully convinced that you're, that you're right. It's amazing. Let us listen to our Lord's parable again, just one moment here. A certain man made a great supper and bade many and his servant at supper time to say to them that they were bidden, meaning you're invited. Come, for all things are now ready. Dinner's ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. Wow. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said... I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them, meaning he wants to test them out. I pray thee, have me excused. And then finally, another one said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. My favorite excuse in that list was the one that said he was just married. Without a lot of explanation, the other ones all gave these explanations, right? They've convinced themselves so much so that they feel that that, that uh, excuse will translate over to uh, ha having them happily excused. But this one just said, I just got married. Nothing else said. I personally would not have used that excuse for if it weren't for God helping me, marriage would be very difficult, but I digress. At numerous times each day, we secretly rationalize, or rather justify to ourselves, our avoidance of duty. And duty comes in all its tiny forms every day. 
It is especially a small duty that we are prone to excuse ourselves from. And then our conscience ceases gradually to enlighten us as to our duty. In other words, we get used to making excuses. So much so that it becomes a natural part of how we manage ourselves, how we think. We are forever finding excuses not to do things we ought to be doing, and it snowballs to a point. It snowballs where we could end up failing to achieve very important milestones in our life that we've gotta, we, we need to achieve. The consequences of a lifetime of doing this are enormous, and our parable today alludes to that. Again, it said, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Let my house be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Shall taste of my supper. What is he talking about? What, what's, is he actually talking about food supper? No. He's talking about everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. They were always making excuses. Let us not deceive ourselves by letting a pattern of excuses grow in our life. Be on watch for it. Don't convince yourself of something that's not, that doesn't really exist. So what is the answer to this tendency to avoid doing our God-given duties and to excuse and justify ourselves? And how did those in our gospel, like the folks in our gospel parable today, the answer is to constantly live in the presence of God. He is always near us. He's closer to us than we are ourselves. You've heard me say before, maybe, um, God is as close to us as white is on snow. He sees everything. He who loves us and gives us moment by moment the gift of life. We're alive. God made us. God will be our judge. We have but one life, and God's judgment on our life is unavoidable. Let us not blind ourselves to what we are doing by allowing a pattern of excuses to fill up our days. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, clear our minds of troublesome excuses that work to insulate us from our duties. Help us prevent straying away from you, Lord. We can be like lost sheep. We need the touch of your love to keep us on track in professing the true faith and acknowledging the glory of the eternal trinity and the power of thy majesty to worship the unity. Grant that by steadfastness in the same faith we may evermore be defended from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ Almighty, Amen.